10. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sex sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Today's Gospel is from John 1, commencing at verse 43. Praise and glory to God. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses rose about, wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite, in whom there was no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, 
I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ the Word. Please sit. Uh, will you pray with me? God, God, here we are. We're here in this place and in this time on this day. Will you hold us before you and help us to hear you today? God, would you send your word out and don't let it return until it's done everything that you desire for it to do. We trust you. There's a word that's repeated throughout the readings today. It only has four letters, but it's a big word. It's a word that has height and depth and layers. We heard it in the stories and writings of these three guys, David, Samuel, and Nathaniel. K N O W. No. God knows us. Scripture tells us so. It doesn't just say it once, but it repeats it over and over again. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, it says. You know my motivations and intentions, my busyness and my striving. You know my passions, what pushes me to keep getting up. You know my fears and you know my courage. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. God, you know my plans and the heart that makes them. You know the word on my tongue before I do. God, you know the ugly and the beautiful. You know when my words are sweet, but my heart isn't. When I'm faking it, or manipulating. You know when my words fumble and fail to verbalize all that's inside that I long to share. Just as your eyes saw my unformed body, so you see my unformed words, knowing them before a single one leaves my mouth. You know the heart that the words come from. You hem me in behind and before. God, you know all that there is in me. You know where I've come from, who I am. 
You know my family and my ancestry. You know my papa. The layers, the stories. You know where I come from. You hold that. And God, you know my future, my hopes, my ambitions, my dreams, my fears. You know all that lies ahead and you hold that. There is nowhere that I can go on the outside of me or on the inside of me and you are not there already. There is no part of me that lies outside of your knowing of me. You made me. Your knowledge of me is complete. You understand me, God. You made me. We are in a world that is more and more disconnected from knowing. There's always been the ability to create a mask and to hide behind it. But today, with the added digital online world, that is magnified almost exponentially. It is so easy to create an identity and then to engage with everyone using that identity. And then to live it for so long, so persuasively, and with such commitment that it becomes you. You forget that it's not you. The problem with this is that it's a facade and behind it is a whole bunch of hiding, deep loneliness or hurt, deep isolation and a longing to be really known but increasingly limited opportunities or ways of doing so. As the facade is practiced and strengthened and practiced and strengthened. And there's a quiet, persistent whisper that if they actually knew me, they wouldn't or couldn't like me or love me. Hiding isn't new. People have always hidden, ever since that garden in the very beginning. Even if you are known and loved by another as unconditionally as possible, there are still hidden places and masks that happen in us. It's the fears. It's where the sin is. Some of them we're not even aware of. We hide and we don't know it. We portray an image, but we maybe aren't aware of that. We do it in little ways and sometimes in big. You see, part of the human condition is that we are hiders. Psalm 139 is an ancient writing, but it holds truth and understanding that is always new. Jeremiah says in chapter 17 of his book that the heart is deceitful beyond all things. Like he's pretty harsh. He says it's evil. Who really knows how bad it is, he asks. It has levels of deception that we don't even know. And they're our hearts. And therefore we can be unaware of how selfish we really are. It goes on, but I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. God knows us fully, but we don't know ourselves fully. We can learn more of the state of our hearts and come back to that psalm and say new. God you know me. You already knew what I've just learned about myself. You know me. Psalm 139 tells us, you know me, God, in this moment, in this state, 
in this place, in this mindset, you know me. How precious to me are your thoughts, he says. I love that you know me. David knew God clearly. Nathaniel didn't know that Jesus knew him. He didn't know Jesus, so he assumed that Jesus didn't know him. Nathaniel had one question when he met Jesus. How do you know me? And Jesus' reply, I saw you. Isn't that reminiscent of Psalm 139? You saw me. I saw you when you were under the tree. I knew you before. I've always known you. Nathaniel got to have a conversation with Jesus and in that conversation to learn that he was known. You might not know God, but he knows you. He always has. He loves to know you. He delights in you. And he's always longing for you to find him and to know him. Nathaniel came to a place where he knew he was known. And then he knew Jesus clearly. But for Samuel, it was different. It was a time of silence. God was further away. It says that in those days, the word from the Lord was rare. It wasn't easy to feel him there, to know that prayer was more than just a traditional liturgy. Vibrancy was hard to sustain, and so tradition and what was familiar held the people. Samuel ministered before the Lord, but he didn't yet know the Lord. It's possible to be in a place of serving, but to not yet know God. Samuel didn't know God's voice because he hadn't heard it before. The one who should have known straight away, by the way, was Eli, the priest. But Eli didn't know either. But notice this. In the midst of silence and not knowing, there was still the fullness of being known. The silence didn't mean that Samuel was not known. It just was that Samuel didn't know. It's easy to think that because I can't feel God there or because I never think about him, that it's the same for him. He doesn't know me. Samuel's story tells us differently. We are known whether we realize it or not. We are known regardless of whether we know or not. Whatever place we sit in today, whether a David or a Samuel or a Nathaniel, we're known. Here's the thing. God knew where to find them. Our God is a finder. He doesn't wait until we stumble across him. He proactively comes and finds us. He's the initiator. The very first question in the Bible is from God. In Genesis 3.9, he speaks to the very first people who've done the very first act of hiding. Where are you? He says. He's a finder. He knew where and how to find Samuel. He knew where and how to find Nathaniel. He knows where and how to find you. I saw you, Jesus says to Nathaniel. His eyes saw our unformed body, says David. Samuel, he called three times, standing and waiting for him. He knew Samuel's name. But why does he want to 
find us. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Because he always has new for us. New understanding of him and ourselves. New freedom. New experience. New wisdom. New boldness. New confidence. New ability to love. New learning. New growing. New. Samuel's response to God was wonderfully simple. And it was the right way round. Speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. In truth, isn't that response so often the other way round? Listen, Lord. Your servant's speaking. Because Samuel was in a place of listening, he was able to hear. God told him some stuff, and within that was held the step to trust God new. A step of obedience. You see, that's how God works. He, he always wants us to know him more, which means that the relationship can never, ever just stand still and repeat the same over and over and over again. In Lamentations, it says that his mercies or his compassions are new every morning. It's not just that he repackages them. They're new. God's more is infinite. We will never run out of God to know new, ever. Held within knowing him new is always a step of faith. It's stepping out of the known and into the uncharted, the unknown. The Bible calls it walking by faith, not by sight. David heard and responded. Nathaniel heard and responded. Samuel heard eventually and responded. And God continued to know them and they continued to know him. God knows you. He knows you. There's no part of you that's outside his knowing you. He longs for you to know him. He always takes the initiative. He loves you. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Amen. For intercessions today, we'll use the form of words on page 413 of the Red Prayer Books. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the Church. We pray for the Church in this community place that it holds in the hearts of this congregation. And we welcome all those who are here on holiday who have chosen to come to this church in this place today. Father, enliven the church for its mission, that we may be salt of the earth and light to the world. I'd like us to pray for our young people. In the last few weeks, we've seen a teenager 
get a child out of a pool and save that child's life doing CPR. And we've seen teenagers on beaches going into the water to rescue people that are in trouble in the water and save their lives. And when we look around our communities, we see our young people doing exceptional things and sometimes we don't notice. And we know that our young people are and can be exceptional. So let us pray for the young people in our communities and what they bring to our communities, what they bring to each other. Let's think about our young people as they find their meanings in the world and as we hope that more of them also find meaning in the word of God in the world. Lord, breathe fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. We pray for the world. I'd like us to pray particularly for people who are really, really wealthy and who have a lot of stuff. Because it must be a difficulty sometimes knowing what to do with it. Lord, I'd like you to be with people who have a lot. Let their minds be open to consider others in the world. Let their minds be open to look around them and see where there is need. That they may have the wisdom to see where resources are needed and can be given. So that the world can be a better place for their giving and that the world can be a better place for those who have less. As we look around the world, we see many examples of countries, places, where there's not equality, where there are people who have much and people who have little. Lord, open the hearts of those in positions of power and those in positions of wealth to work actively to make the world a fairer, better, more caring place. Creator of all, lead us and every people into ways of justice and peace, that we may respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for the community. We pray for nations who are particularly badly affected by COVID-19 and the various new variants of that, and for their struggles as they try and find ways of dealing with that. We thank you for your blessings on this small nation that we have managed as well as we have with the wisdom of the decisions made by others, that we are able to go about our lives with the facility and the ease which we are able to at the present time. As we look around the world and we look at those other governments, those other leaders, Lord, help them to find wisdom to make the best decisions for the nations which they serve and the people that they lead. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others, that all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. We pray for those in need, for those who are physically unwell, for those who are mentally unwell, for those who struggle 
to be well. Lord, may your hand be on all those who work to support the well-being and the health of others. Particularly for nurses and staff, staffing wards all around the world, dealing with people who are chronically unwell. God of hope, Comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. We remember particularly those who work to support others. And we acknowledge our own roles as well in also being compassionate, caring, thinking about others, doing what we can to support other people when they are struggling. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. We remember those who have died and those who mourn. We remember particularly today the Reverend Peter, his family, those who know him, those who care about him, and remembering that he's where he really, really wanted to be. We remember those others who may be known to us, who have passed. And we remember with thanksgiving those who have died in the faith of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Father, into your hands we commend them. Give comfort to those who mourn. Bring them peace in the time of loss. We praise you for all your saints who have entered your eternal glory. May their example inspire and encourage us. We pray for ourselves and our ministries, for the role that each of us has as we go out into the world from this place, knowing that Christianity is not just for Sundays. We pray for each of us, for the work that we do, for the people that we interact with, let our thoughts be compassionate, let our words be wise. Let our actions be caring. Lord, we know that when we pray, you listen. With today's readings, let's also remember that sometimes it's really good for us to listen so that we can hear you better. Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may walk in your presence, your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey, we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May Christ, as he comes, deliver you from your guilt, anxiety, and resentment. May Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.